Well, I just got back from seeing the remake of my all-time favorite movie, Fright Night, and it's made me a little bit depressed and annoyed, but instead of lamenting about the state of the horror genre in Hollywood with its endless remakes and sequels, uh, I instead I'm going to be focusing on what I consider to be the best 10 horror films of the past 10 years. So I hope you like my picks. Um, feel free to comment down there and let me know what I forgot to mention. Uh, so let's get started with number 10. The Signal takes place in a city called Terminus, where in the middle of the night, all televisions, phones, and radios become infected by a deadly transmission that spreads like the plague. The transmission causes the citizens to succumb to uh, murderous rages, bizarre hallucinations, and paranoia. And the film plays like a post-apocalyptic thriller where the few survivors are trying to escape from the infected. What sets this film apart is its narrative structure, which separates itself into three distinct sections, each held by a different director. And because they have different tones and visual styles, it almost feels like a horror anthology, but it's really just telling one story from three different perspectives. Uh, it's a very violent and chaotic movie, um, but there's also some tenderness because the two main characters are lovers who want nothing more than to just find each other, and they are likable and sympathetic, and so you are rooting for them. I feel compelled to mention the middle story, which might piss some people off. I personally dug it. Uh, it pretty much disrupts the tension and the terror and goes for laughs. Um, I think it added another layer of hysteria to the story and made the city of Terminus seem even crazier. And it made me wonder like, how something like this would put a damper on a dinner party. Uh, I remember I saw the signal when I was sick at home. I was stuck on the couch for a couple days and I must have watched eight movies or so. And this is the one that really stuck with me and left the strongest impression. And like a virus, I just couldn't get it out of my head. Unlike the signal, which was direct to video, Frailty played in theaters all over the country. But sadly, the box office returns were dismal and I was the only person to show up for a screening one time, and it was cool having the theater entirely to myself, but when it was over, I felt a little bit sad that this masterpiece of a film was not attracting a wider audience. Uh, let's see. It's a twisted southern gothic tale, directed by and starring Bill Paxton as a loving father who wakes up his two kids one night to tell them that he was just visited by an angel and that they've been chosen by God to carry out his will, and that involves destroying demons that are disguised as humans. Uh, the father never seems like a typical villain, uh, and instead he just seems like a sincere man plagued by delusions. And his two kids uh, react differently uh, to what uh, he tells them. Um, the younger son is devoted to his father completely and believes everything he says and is more than happy to assist in any way that he can, whereas the older son is an atheist who believes his father is just sick in the head. And it, it's heartbreaking how the father makes the two children accompany him on this mission, and that pretty much involves uh, kidnapping people in town and bludgeoning them over the head with an axe. It sounds grisly, but most of the violence is off screen, and rather than focus on the violence, more emphasis is placed on just the unbelievable amount of pressure that these two children are under. Uh, uh, Frailty works so well because you get such a clear sense of what the characters are going through and these are uh, tragic dilemmas with no easy solutions. It seems to be based on the kind of stories you hear in the news about mothers who kill their kids after Jesus tells them to, uh, which might seem like kind of a downer, but uh, it's so engrossing and every scene is so alive and you have no idea what's going to happen next. And with the possible exception of Kenneth Branagh's Dead Again, I can't remember the last time a plot twist completely knocked me on my ass like this one did. So yeah, check this movie out. It's awesome. If people were to ask me what the horror genre is all about and why I love it so much, I feel like I could just say, this is why, and make them watch The Mist, which is the kind of dark and stormy night creature feature that I would have loved to have back when I was eight or nine, beginning my flirtation with the genre. It takes place in a uh, coastal town in Maine, and it suffers through a freaky thunderstorm, and the next morning this mysterious fog permeates through the town and unleashes giant insects and various ghoulies. And uh, it centers around a group of citizens that have taken temporary shelter in a supermarket. And like some of the great horror films have taught us in the past, it's, uh, it's not just supernatural or the bloodthirsty creatures you have to worry about, 
but also your fellow humans, because some of us act like total fucking morons in the midst of a crisis. And unfortunately for the protagonist in the mist, one of the uh, citizens in the supermarket is a batshit crazy Christian woman that is preaching that the Armageddon has come. The Mist is uh, it's well paced, clever, and offers an effective balance of quiet tension and uh, stunning special effects. It kind of plays like a big budgeted Twilight Zone episode, and on the DVD there is this uh, feature that lets you watch it in beautiful black and white. Uh, it was uh, based on a Stephen King short story and directed by Frank Darabont, who of course also directed uh, Shawshank Redemption. And he also wrote the screenplays to um, Night, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3 and the remake of The Blob, which are both uh, two excellent films from the 80s. And uh, 2007 was uh, one hell of a good year for Stephen King adaptations because another film uh, will be uh, appearing later in the video. a breath of fresh air when it came out because for far too long the Twilights and the Buffy's had been dominating the subgenre and Let the Right One In is a very serious intense movie. It earns its R rating uh, because of its you know because of violence and gore but it's also an incredibly sweet movie. It's about a 12 year old boy who is bullied at school and is pretty much all alone in the world until he meets a girl in his neighborhood that says that she's been 12 years old for a very long time. What this movie does that I really hadn't seen in another vampire film is emphasize not only the painful mundane lifestyle of being a vampire but also the misery of having to help one on a regular basis whether you're the best friend or a lover or a guardian uh, it's the kind of relationship with no happy ending and uh, surprisingly Hollywood didn't even try to come up with a happier ending uh, this movie uh, is a Swedish film that had only been out for a couple of years before Hollywood got its greedy little paws on it and took advantage of the fact that most Americans are too stupid to appreciate a film with subtitles. Um, and I know I do get a little PMSE when it comes to remakes, but this one was actually really well done. Uh, it has a very strong cast and it kept the same snowy landscapes. The few minor changes were just to make the action scenes more suspenseful. Um, so even though I still don't think it should have been made, uh, let me in, well, is, is as good as the original. And number six is Neil Marshall's The Descent, which is undoubtedly one of the scariest films to come out in a long time. And it's the, uh, the kind of movie that uh, you almost feel a physical pain as you're watching because of your frazzled nerves and your increasingly rapid heartbeat. And when it's over, you just need to go outside and walk around for a while just to regain your composure. It doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun, but um, I don't know. Every now and then, it's just uh, a neat experience to let a film completely kick your ass like that. It is about six friends who, uh, who are all breathtakingly beautiful, of course, and they're thrill seekers who decide to go caving in, I believe it's West Virginia, but I could be wrong. Uh, and the film preys on universal fears in the beginning, like claustrophobia and complete abandonment. So you're already kind of spooked out of your mind even before the creatures show up. It's the kind of movie where things just get worse and worse and worse for the characters, and you can't imagine how any of them could possibly escape, uh, but it's still exhilarating to watch them try. The sets are breathtaking and spooky, the, uh, the acting is strong all around, and the sound editing is really effective, whether it's just drops of water that you hear in the background or uh, the hissing of one of the creatures. And if gore is your thing, then you will not be disappointed. Uh, the Descent was revered by the horror community, but it just, I don't know, nobody seemed excited about a sequel. I guess it just seemed too, per too perfect on its own, but nevertheless we were given a sequel, and aside from some very colorful action sequences, I can't quite recommend it. One of the most polarizing films in recent years is the based on a true story shark thriller Open Water. It seems like I'm the only one among my friends who really loves the movie, and I don't get that at all, but uh, whatever, sometimes it's lonely being right. 
Open Water is a true miracle in filmmaking, in my opinion, and it shows what you can do with a really small budget, even though I think everybody involved uh, is insane for putting themselves in such danger. Uh, basically, they couldn't afford to use uh, fake sharks, and so they literally threw the actors in heavily shark-infested waters. Uh, but the results were very uh, amazing, so uh, yeah, I'm glad they did it. It is based on a true story of an American couple who were vacationing in Australia, and uh, they decided to go scuba diving, only to resurface and discover that their boat has left them behind. And the actors do a really convincing job. Their reactions are so natural, so that we're f we feel like we're floating in the water with them. Uh, for uh, for most of the running time, it's just two people floating alone in the ocean. Um, but there's so much drama in every scene, and I don't know. There's something so fascinating about watching these two people cope in such ridiculously dangerous situations, and I don't know, and we know that this has happened so many times. And I, it's just so hard to even fathom. And uh, there's one scene in particular that really got to me. It takes place uh, at night during a thunderstorm, and every now and then uh, a flash of lightning will briefly illuminate the water. The the actors, and every now and then a shark, and I don't know, it was just, it was one of the most intense scenes I've ever witnessed in my entire life, and it really got to me. I, don't know, I guess it's just my ultimate nightmare right there on screen. I just cannot imagine anything more frightening than that, to be completely forgotten by the world and to be at the mercy of nature for uh, hours and hours and hours. Um, oh yeah, but I know, uh, I know Shark Week is really popular, and you're not going to find a more realistic shark movie than Open Water, so I hope you will check it out if you have not already. Uh, and I saw another pretty decent shark movie just last week called The Reef, and that also used real sharks. It was very entertaining. And uh, there was a sequel to Open Water. Uh, it was just called Adrift for the longest time, and then before it hit the States, the title got changed to Open Water 2 Adrift, just to capitalize off of the original. And there are no sharks in the movie, so I'm sure that that would piss a lot of people off. Uh, it's certainly not a dull movie, um, but the characters are so ignorant, and they just do one stupid thing after another, and the ending is really disappointing. Next up is the Halloween-themed anthology, Trick or Treat, which will take you back to the lovely days of Creepshow, Tales from the Crypt, Tales from the Dark Side, Goosebumps, and Nickelodeon's Are You Afraid of the Dark? In my previous video blog, I counted down the top 10 greatest films to watch on Halloween, and I had this at number one, so if you want to hear more of my thoughts about this movie, please watch that video so I don't have to repeat myself too much. Uh, but uh, it's, right now it's in the middle of September, and uh, pretty soon I'm going to be officially kicking off my favorite season, and there's no better way than to just watch this movie, because it will immediately put me in the Halloween spirit. It has everything a horror fan could want as well. It's got vampires, werewolves, mentally challenged zombie children, a psychopathic principal who carves heads as well as pumpkins, uh, sexy girls, a ferocious little pumpkin demon, projectile vomiting, uh, insane amounts of jack-o'-lanterns and fall foliage, and healthy doses of both scares and chuckles. Unfortunately, there is yet to be any word of a Trick or Treat Part 2, and that's one sequel I would love to see, uh, but I'll keep my fingers crossed and maybe Sam will have an announcement for us on Halloween that would make Halloween enthusiasts and, and horror aficionados extremely happy. Very few films provided as much joy and sincerity as Trick or Treat, and for a film that was never even released in theaters, it has an extremely healthy and active fan base on Facebook, IMDb, and various movie sites. And I think the reason for that is just because it reminded us all how much fun it could be to watch a scary movie. And unlike a huge majority of recent horror films, it didn't wallow in pain and misery. It didn't systematically torture its main characters for 90 minutes. It didn't, and it didn't take itself too seriously. It cleverly interconnected four different tales of terror set on the greatest night of the year, and the results were pure magic.